and welcome back guys to our rapid revision 2.0 course we are very proud and happy to launch this just exactly about six weeks before the exam and uh, the idea about this course is not to give you the whole idea of medicine but to help you revise rapidly the core topics that are being tested in your mrcp part one examinations right so not only we'll be doing the live doubt clearing sessions now but we'll also be dealing with the extremely high yield topics and the questions with in-depth explanation of those questions particularly don't worry we'll be covering the full topics all the topics that are being tested in your exam and all the important topics will be covered but in a rapid way right the crack medicine way so don't just study medicine let's crack medicine let's get into the stuff let's do some mcqs and let's try and find out what it is that the mrcp part 1 uk exam is trying to test you on all right let's get started okay so here we go here's your first question for the evening and uh, you have approximately 15 to 35 seconds to deal with them so come on guys i want you all to answer in the comments box as well as you can go to our telegram channel and you can post it there as well right all the updates about the course and the things will be available on our telegram channel as well for those of you who aren't our subscribers yet please hit the subscribe button as well as go and follow us on a telegram channel t.me slash crack medicine so here's they're talking about an 18 year old woman presenting to the er with acute onset of shortness of breath dizziness tingling in both hands and chest pain right she presents with the same symptoms three times in the last month the clinical examination and chest x-ray are both normal so what's the most likely diagnosis? So what do you think guys? What's the most likely diagnosis? Now let's break it down for you, right? Let's go step by step and understand what's happening over here. So it's a young female, right? Okay. And she's coming to the ER, not to your OPD or ward, right? So this is how we are going to tackle the questions. We are going to understand how we have to deal with the questions, right? And she has SOB. Now, SOB can point towards many things, right? So the first one that the SOB is pointing towards here could be in an ER scenario, we always think of MI, you have to rule that out. But 18 year old female, we are not thinking of MI, right? Correct. So let's move ahead and understand what's happening over here. She has dizziness and tingling both. Okay. So chest pain is there. Now she has had three admissions in the past one month. So this means it's a recurring problem. Now tell me which of the following is a recurring disease. Okay, tuberculosis can be there. Pulmonary embolism cannot recur per se in one month. Mycoplasma pneumonia, okay, the age group is fine, looks okay. But the symptom of chest pain, what do you think guys? And what about chlamydia? So this is how you have to rule out the options. Now this is definitely not a case of pneumonia because you won't have tingling in both hands just with a chlamydia pneumonia. Also chlamydia cytosis is the one that they are trying to talk about over here. And there's no mention of any bird or avian groups or anything like that, right? So what's left over here is your hyperventilation syndrome. And this is what we are talking about. This is a perfect definition of hyperventilation syndrome young female presenting to you in the er right let's see what the idea over here is psychogenic breathlessness right it's a diagnosis of exclusion and irregular breathing is the one in fact more than irregular breathing there is always a component of rapid breathing associated with that right so there is a rapid breathing component hyperventilation causes paresthesia dizziness and sometimes even tends to create collapse kind of a scenario non-specific features include fatigue the most important background history is of depression and anxiety right now the underlying psychiatric condition needs to be treated over here okay and it does not need any medication from antibiotics point of view right it is not required so this is basically a diagnosis of exclusion now <clears throat> The idea of putting this question over here is that some of the people who are taking the exam 
are undergoing this right they are having hyperventilation syndrome they are feeling very much anxious about the exam they are feeling dizzy about the exam but don't worry guys we are here to help you out in any and every way possible the idea of crack medicine with us the whole team is working really hard right now to help you achieve that goal of yours that target of clearing the mrcp exam and make it as easy and as understandable and as enjoyable for you right so that's what we are doing here now enough of chit chat let's move on to the next question okay so i'll give you exactly 30 seconds to tackle this one because in the exams i want you to ace the exams not just clear it right in the video you can pause the questions later on for those of you who are not watching it live you can always pause the video and read the questions for you know, to understand whatever it is that you are looking at now let me tell you a way to tackle a question from internal medicine point of view okay so we have here a homeless now as soon as the word homeless comes over here what are we thinking guys the first thing that we think of in a homeless guy in the mrcp point of view now this is where the internal medicine versus mrcp exam differs a little bit and that is what we are here to teach you we are not here to teach you the depths and the breadths of internal medicine because you all are already experts on that i do not have to tell you anything about that but what i am here to tell you about is the exact way the methodology that we are going to follow in our crack medicine lectures and classes that how to deal with the questions and what it is that the examiner is looking for right so the first thing that i always suggest is read the last sentence of the question first this gives and saves a lot of time right it not only uh, gives you an idea but it saves a lot of time so what is the most likely cause they are asking about the cause look at the options so we are basically trying to deal with some infectious origin over here okay let's go here again word by word homeless homeless means we can have trauma right because they are living on the street we will definitely have an history of alcohol we are going i'm talking only about from the mrcp part one point of view don't get me wrong guys right so there can what i'm thinking right now is probably ethylene glycol poisoning right so these are the things that this is how you have to attempt and approach your questions now when i talk of ethylene glycol poisoning what is the first thing that hits your head guys come on yes acidosis right what type of acidosis please type in the comment box and let me know that you all are preparing really well so let me know what is the type of acidosis that happens when a person consumes ethylene glycol next word is alcoholic okay very well has been admitted to hospital with increasing s of b sweats and purulent sputum okay cool so he has purulent sputum as well okay now the ed records indicate that he was admitted in an unconscious state a few days ago right he was unconscious a few days ago but self-discharged in examination there is pyrexia dullness at the apex he has fever and there is dullness at the apex this is the apex of your lung with bronchial breathing now what does this bronchial breathing suggest over here when you have a dull lung with bronchial breathing over there what are we talking about guys come on you're talking about this is very typical of pneumonia right very simple thing now his chest x-ray shows right middle lobe consolidation right middle lobe consolidation okay so this is your right lung and this is your left lung we are looking at the ap view but if we look at a lateral and supine view from the right side how does it look like it looks somewhat like this right the main bronchus enters from the middle lobe right the right always tends to be a little bit higher than the left right so what happens is when a person is in supine position for a long time you can have the contents from your esophagus go into the 
bronchial pathway right the person can aspirate and when he is lying in a supine position the most usual location is your middle lobe of which lung right lung because gravity acts over here and here are the contents the gastric contents they come and accumulate over here cause aspiration pneumonia right so this is what is happening over here okay now this question the wordings of the question can change the design of the question can change but the concept of aspiration pneumonia is not going to change right so once you understand what and how aspiration pneumonia happens in patients you will never miss it in your exam so let's move ahead and see right so usually the superior segments of the lower lobes or posterior segments of the upper lobes are the dependent parts in the recumbent position okay and fever and sputum that is often putrid and you have evidence of chronic disease with weight loss anemia there would be subtle deficiencies of vitamin c associated with that nutritional deficiencies right vitamin b12 deficiency will be there right thiamine deficiency will be there b6 deficiency will be there so there, there's a lot of things that go hand in hand and you have to think of it now another thing that i want you to answer me right away is what infection do you think is most likely to be happening over here guys what is the organism that you think is the one that is causing the disease it's klebsiella okay so if the same question were to ask you that what which is the most likely organism causing this disease over here in an aspiration pneumonia with an homeless alcoholic man type of picture it's klebsiella pneumonia right so this is how you have to deal with your mcqs in your exam as well and you have to take approximately about a minute or so for every question so you really have to be thorough with your approach of the exam right you don't only have to understand the pattern of the examination but you really have to be you know like on your edge ready to ace it okay so moving on to the next question of the evening there's a 43 year old woman referred by her gp with a productive cough and inspiratory crackles at the left base which one of the following is considered to be an adverse prognostic factor adverse prognostic factor so when we talk of a prognostic factor in a pneumonia like picture what they're basically trying to ask you is guys absolutely correct they're asking you about a curve 65 scoring okay now not only will you encounter it very frequently in your exams but the mrcp exam tends to make you understand that these things are not to be taken only in your exams but also to be used in your words right in your rounds so you have to be very thorough with your CURBS 65 scoring systems. So tell me what is the correct answer for this one? And the correct answer is, come on guys, think of it. Bilateral changes on X-ray? No, there is no mention of X-ray in the CURBS 65 scoring. BP of 98 upon 65. So the cutoff would be 90 by 60. Anything lesser than this, either systolic or diastolic. You have to understand this, 80 upon 60, is also considered one score okay 90 upon 58 is also considered one score and 80 upon 50 is also considered only one score you don't give two points for 80 upon 50 all right so that's the thing guys so what's the correct answer there is no mention of oxygen saturation right there is no mention of that in the scoring system respiratory rate of 28 per minute is it within the limit or more than the limit or less what do you think guys the rate is more than 30 that is the limit so we are left with serum urea 7.1 okay so 7.0 is the cutoff limit for serum urea so that's the correct answer guys here the right answer is urea 7.1 now So urea 7 millimoles is associated with an adverse prognosis and is a component of CURB 65 scoring. Now here are your indicators what you will use okay and we have spoken about it right away right so you know this now. Now the point over here is confusion is the one that has to be newer onset. Now you can have a 75 year old female with long-standing alzheimer's and this could be given in your history okay 
and then they can go on talking about confusion do you think it's a new one no it's not a new onset confusion right so you have to think very very carefully whether it is new onset as well as there is another criteria and the criteria is your mmse test that is your mini mental test score and this should be less than eight okay another one is your urea c u r means respiratory rate over here b is blood pressure we've already spoken about it and age is 65 years or older more than equal to 65 okay 65 also scores one by the way okay so as you go on increasing the score the mortality goes on increasing very rapidly in somewhat this kind of a fashion exponential right so you have to understand that and deal with the question appropriately i think that's enough for this one let's move on to the next one so tell me guys what do you think about it i'll give you 10 seconds to go through the question okay so we have a 26 year old female who arrives in uk from australia so what is the thing going on over here guys it's a long duration flight yes she has been in a sitting position for a long period this is what they mean by when they talk of arriving from a very far off country few days later she presents to hospital with pleuritic chest pain and breathlessness okay She's not on the OCPs and has no family or personal history of DVT. Okay. As well as pulmonary embolism, there's no history as such. Okay. So when they perform a radiological study, that could be CTPA, CT pulmonary angiogram, or could be a VQ scan. Right, guys? And she started on warfarin. This confirms a pulmonary embolus how long would you continue warfarin therapy in these circumstances so the only thing that you have to understand in this particular question is only one thing that is whether it is a provoked or whether it is a unprovoked pe right because the modality of treatment differs so do you think this is a provoked pe come on guys or this is an unprovoked pe right so that is the difference in here and the answer is three months guys so the only risk factor is a long haul flight which is a temporary risk factor right so this is a provoked pe because she has a history here right so when you have a provoked pe the usual duration of warfarin treatment is three months what happens after three months is you call the patient back and you assess her condition over there if you think that she needs he or she needs more treatment because of some underlying disease condition you can prolong the treatment but usually three months is sufficient in other cases you stop the treatment at three months now the other modality is where you have an unprovoked pe or you have a dvt or pe with a background of malignancy if you talk of a patient who is a patient of let's say ca breast the same patient would be of ca breast now in this particular case you are going to continue the treatment for at least six months okay so that's the difference guys right now patients with unprovoked p should be treated initially for three months right and like i said they have to be reviewed at the three month stage for consideration of extension to six months okay but in a particular case of active malignancy, six months is definitely recommended. Okay. Now the question here is again, now you can ask me that this thing is not very clear, right? So how to go about it? If you have a provoked P, you have to straight away go for three months of anticoagulation. No doubt about it, because the question will not give you options over here that you call the patient again after three months, right? Sometimes they might not mention that you call the patient again after three months. So what do you do in that particular case? In that particular case, when you have an unprovoked P, but you have a history of 
and you have a history of malignancy going on you go away for you give the anticoagulation for six months no doubt in that let's talk of an unprovoked pe where there is no mention of malignancy although i'm very sure that such a death will not be tested at your part one level but let's talk of it let's see how to deal with that question now if this patient has some underlying history okay like let's say the patient got a malignancy resected somewhere ago they had a ca history of ca that points very clearly towards six months of treatment otherwise what you will do is you will mark the answer as three months why because you can always call the patient back at the three month interval and then consider the circumstances and think whether to consider the next three months of warfarin therapy or not all right so that is what definitely you're not going for lifelong okay and one year also is not you only have to think from these two options three months or six months right so this is how you go about it i hope that's very clear to you now you're better equipped to handle the questions that come on provoked slash unprovoked pe and warfarin usage okay let's move ahead and see what all is there now we have a 41 year old woman presenting to the ED with sudden onset of pleuritic chest pain and breathlessness. Okay, chest x-ray reveals a large right-sided pneumothorax. Okay, pleural aspiration fails to result in adequate re-expansion of the lung and you therefore insert an intercostal tube connected to an underwater seal, ICD. After 24 hours of ICD, the lung has not re-expanded despite the fact that the drain is still swinging with respiration what would you do next so you would choose an option next what would you want to do do you want to perform a high volume high pressure suction do you want to do that guys okay when we talk of lung guys if you do not understand anything understand one basic thing okay do not use high pressure just remember this golden rule if you do not understand the critical care mechanisms just understand this that high pressures are not recommended for the lung you can go for high volumes but you do not have to go for high pressures so this option is definitely ruled out okay negative suction should be started at minus one to minus two centimeter of water now the initial pressure that to begin with is somewhere around minus three centimeter so this is very low okay Refer for immediate surgical intervention. We'll come to this. Reposition the chest drain and wait for another 24 hours. Now, when we talk of referring, you have to be very sure that you have done whatever it is in your hands to refer the patient, right? And that too for immediate surgical intervention. Look very carefully at every word of the answer stem. Specifically, even if you don't forget a word like adequate and underwater seal while underwater seal is very important for this particular question but in your answer stem look at every word okay now they're asking not only about a surgical review they're asking for an immediate surgical intervention so i don't think that is required over here why because only 24 hours have passed from the episode that is the first thing the second thing is reposition the chest drain now read over here guys the drain is still swinging with respiration. That means that the drain is in correct place, right? It's in the pleural cavity in the correct place. That is why it is swinging. A swinging drain, like this is the seal and this is the drain. So it keeps moving with respiration up and down, right? So if this is happening, that means that the drain is in the correct place, okay? So what is left? Wait for another 24 hours. That is the correct answer because you reassess the patient after 48 hours. When you put an intercostal chest drain, you reassess the patient only after 48 hours. So 24 hours is a little bit early to talk about the surgical interventions. When would you consider surgical intervention? At least after three to five days. Now, if the appropriate section fails to result in adequate re-expansion by three to five days, then you will refer to a thoracic surgeon. So in the earlier scenario, at least three days, that is 72 hours, right? When they were talking of pressures, negative section should be started at minus 10 to 20, right? Because here they were saying only minus one to two, which is very low. 
ओके हाई वॉल्यूम हाई प्रेशर साक्षन शुड नॉट बी यूज सो हाई वॉल्यूम हाई प्रेशर साक्षन यू शुड गो फॉर हाई वॉल्यूम लो प्रेशर साक्षन राइट लो प्रेशर साक्षन यू शुड गो फॉर दैट इफ एट ऑल यू वेर टू गो फॉर दैट so here you have to just wait out for the next 24 hours because the time for reassessment is 48 hours okay and if the pneumothorax fails to re expand or there is persistent bubbling even after 48 hours then you should call in a respiratory specialist this is what you are going to do in your wards as well because at that time negative suction is required okay now also a point to be noted over here is this is your normal intrapleural pressure during expiration and during inspiration it is minus 8 cm of water right so this is how you are going to deal with your mcqs mind you guys these all mcqs are really 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 the very important ones they are not just being over here just for the discussion of respiratory point of view but they are here because i am trying to tell you the real exam scenario and how you can maximize your chances of acing the exam all right guys so come on and answer this one in the next 10 seconds okay so we have a 25 year old guy who is a smoker we don't know if it's a guy or not right our uh, five cigarettes per day comes to the clinic complaining of recurrent hemoptysis so the keyword over here is recurrent hemoptysis and that he has had he it's a he so he has had for the past 2 years now he has been treated for intermittent cough and respiratory infections over the past few years so this is an ongoing thing that's continuously going on in examination he looks a little thin and otherwise he is well respiratory examination raises the suggestion of a left upper lobe collapse left upper lobe collapse okay so we are talking again of the upper lobe collapse very good there are no other abnormal findings investigations reveal hemoglobin of 11.9 that's a little bit on the lower end w b c or the white cell counts at 5.9 which is pretty okay platelets okay sodium okay potassium okay and creat as well okay so the chest x ray obviously shows the left upper lobe to be collapsed which one of the following is the most likely diagnosis now let's look at the options let's think that we don't know anything about this person let's look at the options that are given let's forget that we understand respiratory medicine and respiratory system let's just look at the options and try to deal with that i'm looking at inhaled foreign body right now right do you think it's an inhaled foreign body i don't think so because an inhaled foreign body will not cause recurrent episodes of hemoptysis right so recurrence is not the one that happens with foreign bodies left upper lobe pneumonia okay very correct but again look here i don't think a uh, left upper lobe pneumonia is just going to cause recurrent hem hemoptysis as well as a number of conditions where he was treated earlier in the past few years intermittent cough and respiratory infections so just a simple left upper lobe pneumonia is not going to cause multiple episodes of hemoptysis as well as multiple episodes of respiratory infection so this is also not ruled out very good bronchiectasis will produce massive amounts of sputum now this can go with our patient and in this history but what is the one that stopping us from thinking of this there is no history of massive amount of sputum production also the age of the patient is just 25 years it's too early for the patient to develop a huge bronchiectasis to be you know like producing this amount of cough and respiratory infections but yes this history from here to here can be going very well with bronchiectasis only thing is the history of massive sputum production is missing okay now coming to bronchial carcinoma and bronchial carcinoid 
which of the following do you think is the most likely diagnosis i would say if a patient had bronchial carcinoma then he wouldn't have recurrent episodes of hemoptysis so this is ruled out you are left only with bronchial carcinoid and that is the correct answer guys right this is the correct answer so recurrent hemoptysis with the segmental collapse is typical presentation of bronchial carcinoid right and you will also have the features of carcinoid syndrome right guys so that is a typical of bronchial carcinoid tumor this is a very typical feature very typical presentation okay this is how we are going to deal with the mcqs and this is how we are going to learn together okay we have another question where in a 34 year old woman a cigarette smoker who works as a secretary presents to the chest clinic with anterior chest discomfort and increased effort related breathlessness okay so there are two things happening over here the first is anterior chest discomfort it's not pain but it's slight discomfort as well as increased effort related breathlessness with a painful rash on her anterior shins there are three things now right a chest x-ray confirms bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy now we have four things now i don't think you have any doubt in diagnosing this as sarcoidosis right away why because the most important sentence that you can read in your part one question paper is the presence of bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy if you see this you are approximately 90 percent sure to be dealing with a case of sarcoidosis all right guys so that is the hint over here that's the clue to the answer because of course in sarcoidosis you have bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy there are other stages of chest x-ray findings as well right you might not always have this but this is the most common one encountered. This is the most common one where you diagnose clinically that you're dealing with sarcoidosis. Okay. Let's see what are the other things that the question was telling us about. The anterior shin lesions were erythema nodosum. Okay. And this is a diagnostic feature of sarcoidosis. But there's also this is this is not i wouldn't say that this is a very particular diagnostic but this happens even in your occurs in your tuberculosis as well as lymphoma but in your exam it occurs more often than not in the cases of sarcoidosis okay so that's how you have to understand this okay now the best prognosis and the chances of resolution without the need for treatment is the one wherein you have this case bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy okay guys now pulmonary tuberculosis is incorrect here because it while it can cause bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy there would be other symptoms which are very classic very classic for tuberculosis like fever night sweats weight loss infiltrates on chest radiograph okay but there could also be hemoptysis right so night sweat weight loss and fever these are characteristic features of tuberculosis pulmonary tuberculosis also a geographical distribution of where the patient is coming from could be a hint towards pulmonary tuberculosis for example if the patient tends to come from asian southeast asian countries like india or pakistan or bangladesh you can think of geographical distribution in that area right that these areas have higher incidence of pulmonary tuberculosis so you can think of that right? this is how you have to approach the questions moving on to the next question of the evening 30 year old woman is admitted with a history of recent upper respiratory tract infection as well as subsequent progressive lower limb weakness all right examination confirms loss of her lower limb reflexes and grade 4 by 5 are in her arms which of the following lung function tests would be most useful for assessing her respiratory muscle reserve what are we talking about here guys tell me now whenever you encounter a respiratory question right a patient with respiratory symptoms plus you have a neurological component there are only very few differentials that are going to happen 
in this particular case the most important differential is your Guillain-Barre syndrome right this is what the question is talking about here but you can also think of mycoplasma pneumonia this is the other one that can also cause mononeuropathies okay so be careful but these are usually the only two differentials that you will be dealing with in your exam when a respiratory question is clubbed with a neurological symptom or scenario the question that they are trying to ask over here is slightly different they are asking which is which would be the most useful test for assessing her respiratory muscle reserve so even if you cannot diagnose gbs over here no issues because they are not asking that what they are really asking you in your part one exam is what is the test so the test could be flow volume curves not at all fev1 okay let's see fvc okay frc and peak expiratory flow rate what do you think guys which one is the correct answer so the right answer is always 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 forced vital capacity how do you remember this guys by the way if you were to think of a scenario like this how do you remember that it's fvc and not the other ones because it, it all becomes very confusing and hazy in your exam when you're under a lot of pressure and stress and you've not had food and you have not slept properly and you're still writing the exam and you've had like a very crazy ward week you know in the weeks leading up to your exam so how do you remember this always remember just one word vital right this is the most vital component of your all the values so the vital component is the one which is the most important function assessing the respiratory muscle reserve okay basically we use this to time the treatment of intravenous immunoglobulins okay you should give that as early as possible but if you keep an eye on the fvc of the patient okay the moment you see that the fvc is falling it's the time that you should step up the treatment very rapidly and you should put the patient in an intensive care unit okay not less than that all right so fvc is the correct answer let's move on and understand what other questions we have for the evening okay okay so a 38 year old man presents with emphysema he's a non-smoker now this usually will be seen in a patient who is a smoker right but our question says he is a non-smoker okay he also has abnormal liver function tests okay and his liver biopsy reveals evidence of cirrhosis now we have a patient over here who's just 38 year old right and he has emphysema first he also has liver changes deranged lfts but also not only deranged lfts but his liver biopsy shows cirrhosis of liver what do you think guys could be causing such advanced disease in such an early age of a patient right we are definitely dealing with alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency right pardon my team for using at the rate instead of alpha right because sometimes these things can be tricky so what do you think guys which is the genotype that fits best we are talking of very severe disease that's the hint okay so whenever we are talking of very severe disease go to the end of the spectrum right this is probably the maximum that you are going to see in this year 38 year old patient right this age so what's the end of the spectrum a to z this is the end of the spectrum so this is the correct answer okay now this is not the correct way to remember this but what is the correct way to understand this is this basically describes pi is the constant but these two genotypical values they describe the motility okay now it could be normal it could be slow it could be absent so the normal variant is this the slower variant would be anywhere in between this to the completely absent is this one okay 
So in this R patient, we are probably dealing with PIZZ. Let's check if this is the right answer. All right, this is the right answer. Now this phenotype or genotype has only 15% of normal alpha-1 antitrypsin levels, right? So very early development of advanced disease is seen, right? Eventually they will need transplantation, okay? So this is how you are going to deal with your question, guys. Now, let's move on to the next question of the evening, which talks about, I'm really sorry about that. Let me just clear it up for you. Right? So, are you ready for the next one? Here it is. We're talking of a 58-year-old man who's referred by his GP with probable OSA. Which of the following features is most strongly associated with OSA? Right? Body mass index, BMI of 26 kg per meter square. Okay. Daytime somnolence, upward sleepiness score of 6, normal blood pressure, normal oxygen saturations at night. When we are talking of OSA, the dip in the oxygen saturations at night is the classic definition of OSA, right? That's how you diagnose OSA. Blood pressure is usually increased because we are dealing with a patient who usually has metabolic syndrome. Okay. But blood pressure has basically nothing to do with OSA, right? Epworth sleepiness score of 6 is quite low for diagnosing OSA. And 26 BMI looks pretty okay to me. Daytime somnolence is the one that we are talking about. Do you understand guys how we go about the questions now? Okay. Now, score of 11 or more is suggestive of OSA. Please remember this guys, 11 upon 24 is the score that your patient needs to score as in order to be diagnosed with OSA, right? This is probably the only score where you don't want to score higher. Higher is not good in this one, just like your BMI. In BMI, lower is also not good. So what's good? Good is normal blood pressure and normal oxygen saturations, which are completely against OSA. So what happens in OSA? I am pretty sure you know what happens in OSA. But what happens in the exam when you happen to come across a question of OSA? The first thing that you need to know is the sleepiness, upward sleepiness score of 11 upon 24. This is the first thing. The second thing that you need to know is that the patient will be a patient of metabolic syndrome. Whenever you have a patient of metabolic syndrome, okay, an obese patient, um, let's say the BMI of 30 or more, think of OSA. Okay, whenever the neck size is mentioned more than 18, think of OSA. What was the initial Okay, so here's the most tricky question and the most controversial as well, I would say. What is the initial modality of treatment that you would offer to the patient of OSA? Guys, come on, type in the chat box and let me know. What I would go forward with is, please remember guys, the first and the foremost treatment in cases where you do not have a very serious disease is always a non-pharmacological treatment okay so the first one is weight loss because the patient will not take any medication or any device for a condition which they don't even know it exists right the patient has OSA but they don't know always their partner or someone else who has noticed it will come to you and tell you that okay the patient snores a lot there was probably an apneic episode right that was witnessed right so only then they'll come to you so you have to understand that you cannot straight away go and push them towards a pharmacological therapy so the first one first treatment of choice is always weight loss now you have offered weight loss patient is not responding patient is not interested in weight loss so what is the next modality treatment of choice for osa it is cpap Continuous positive airway pressure guys. This is what you have to use on your patient. Now some would argue with me that mandibular advancement devices are to be used but no guys the answer always is CPAP. Okay. 
if weight loss has already been undertaken right so this is how you have to approach and patient of osa now in the same question if we try to twist the question a bit and we talk of a patient who also has episodes of sleepiness while driving the car what would be the treatment of choice the treatment of choice would be modafinil now here you would interfere with the pharmacotherapy right so this is how you have to approach your questions in your mrcp part one examinations and only and only if you are prepared well you can ace it right let's see the next one okay so we'll be continuing the remaining of the questions for our premium members on our premium members only youtube channel so you can subscribe to that if you are not following us yet please go and follow us on all the channels mentioned over here right guys okay so we'll be discussing like i said only the selective high yield questions for you we have also prepared a very robust q bank which has a very detailed explanation and also the questions are very 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 important very relevant to your exams okay you don't have to feel anxious or you don't have to feel any other thing rather just feel prepared for the exam that's why we are here we have live doubt clearing sessions as well you can ask us not only here but you can also ask us on our telegram channel as well you can post comments here we'll be covering all the topics that are supposed to be covered for mrcb part one examination we are not only offering this for the april diet but we are also offering it for the other remaining two diets of the examination this year right so we'll be continuing more and more mcqs and dealing with it in depth so that you understand not only the correct answer of one particular question but you understand how to deal with that question in the exam however they throw it at you rapid revision 2.0 platinum notes are also being updated on our website so they have highly distilled notes that are very 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 relevant to your exams okay so if it's your first attempt or if it's probably your sixth attempt i would strongly recommend that you come and join us in our journey to help you ace your mrcb part one uk exams all right guys thank you so much for your lovely time have a great evening and guys who are our premium members we'll be continuing the class and we'll be informing you of the schedule shortly thank you so much